All right, everyone. Uh, the other day we started our electromagnetic radiation unit. We talked about it very briefly, but we'll talk about it from the beginning again, just to kind of refresh your memory from last week. Uh, we said that electromagnetic radiation is energy. It is pure energy that's transmitted in a wave-like form. Well, how does that happen? How can you transmit pure energy in a wave-like form without the need for any medium to travel through? Light comes from the sun, comes to the earth. It travels through empty space. Okay? All waves carry energy. But how does the sun transmit energy to the earth without having anything to carry that energy? Well, it consists of this pure energy wave consists of two fields, an electric field wave and a magnetic field wave. And those two waves are perpendicular to each other. Maxwell argued that, that a changing magnetic field can generate a changing electric field. And a changing electric field can generate a changing magnetic field. Therefore, it can be self-perpetuating. It's not that you keep generating more and more and more electromagnetic radiation, but it can at least cause the energy that was produced by whatever caused it in the first place to transmit or to travel from one place to the other without the need for something to travel through, without the need for a medium. Hey, let's take a look over here for a second. We know, we learned the other day, that an accelerating charged particle, a charged particle that's speeding up or slowing down, generates the electromagnetic radiation. It does that because the accelerating charged particle generates a magnetic field. Any charged particle that's moving generates a magnetic field, right? But an accelerating charged particle generates a changing magnetic field. And so if I've got my charged particle that's accelerating over here on the left side of the room, it's going to generate a changing magnetic field. It's going to look something like this. It's a sinusoidal wave. That changing magnetic field is going to generate a changing electric field that looks like this. It's perpendicular to it. Okay, again, it's a sinusoidal wave, but it's perpendicular to the first magnetic field. Now, that changing electric field will generate a changing magnetic field that's going to look like this, which will generate a changing electric field, which will look like this, and so on and so on, and so on. So in, the, in effect, what you get are these two waves, these two sine waves, an electric field sine wave, a magnetic field sine wave, that end up going together, but perpendicular to each other, and perpendicular to the direction of motion. So it looks something like this. One wave going up like this, one wave going out like this. Okay? They go together. The two waves end up looking something like this. Two sine waves, one vertical, one on one axis, one on a perpendicular axis to it. Now, the demonstration that I just did kind of almost infers that it's a continuous wave, that it keeps going. That's not entirely true. If we have just a charged particle that's accelerating, just for a brief moment in time, it produces a pulse, a wave pulse. So we get a crest of a magnetic field that generates a crest of an electric field, that generates a trough of a magnetic field, that generates a trough of an electric field, and so on. The thing that's being generated uh, progresses out from the source. The one that produces the new wave, so the magnetic field that produces the new electric field, and so on, it disappears. It's gone. The energy has moved. So the energy from this magnetic field, once it makes that electric field, the magnetic field is no longer there. It's gone. It, you can't just create energy from nothing. So this magnetic field energy goes into this electric field. This electric field energy then goes into this magnetic field. And this magnetic field energy then goes into this electric field and so on. So in the end, the energy that you had over here is now gone. It's now over here. It's been transmitted from one side to the other side via this changing electric field wave and this changing magnetic field wave. Does that make a little bit of sense? All right. We learned on Friday or on Thursday, whatever day it was, that uh, this is all generated by accelerating charged particles. If we have a continuously accelerating charged particle, charged particle that's accelerating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, then we can generate that continuous electromagnetic wave. That's what we see right now. That's the visible light that's coming from the sun is this uh, continuous wave. But again, if we just have that charged particle that's accelerating for a brief time, we don't get that continuous wave, we just get that wave pulse. Any way you look at it, this electromagnetic radiation, okay, however it's produced, 
whether it's a pulse, whether it's a continuous wave, whatever type of EMR it is, they all travel at the same speed. They all travel in a vacuum at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's about a billion kilometers per hour. That's pretty fast. That is so fast. We've talked about this before when we're talking about the speed of charged particles not being able to exceed that speed, right? The fastest possible thing. Speed of light, speed of EMR. It's so fast that light could make 25, roughly 25 return trips from Halifax to Victoria, 25 return trips in one second. So 50 one-way trips across the country in one second. That's pretty fast. Okay? That's why nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Okay? That's as fast as it can possibly get. Okay? This one I don't think you have written down, but it just still says exactly what we've said verbally already, and that is that electromagnetic radiation is produced by accelerating charged particles. It can include a charged particle speeding up, or it can include a charged particle slowing down. If you want to produce a continuous wave, then you actually end up with both, speeding up and slowing down. The charged particle is going back and forth. It's oscillating back and forth. It speeds up, then it slows down. Then it reverses direction, and it speeds up, then it slows down. Then it reverses direction, and it speeds up, and it slows down. That's what happens with a continuous wave. Okay, the way that we think of an electric field or a magnetic field wave. What do they consist of? Again, it's just repeating what we said verbally already. Electromagnetic radiation is a transverse wave. That's a wave that, that we, we think of every wave as a transverse wave. They're not all. Sound waves are what we call longitudinal waves. But when we picture a wave, when we visualize a wave, we, we visualize the water wave. That's a transverse wave. It's got a series of crests and troughs, except that this wave is actually two waves in one. It's an electric field wave and a magnetic field wave. They're perpendicular to each other. You can see that one's on an x-axis and one's on a y-axis, but they're also in phase with each other. That means that when you have the crest of one, you have the crest of the other. When you have the trough of one, you have the trough of the other. Also notice that they move perpendicular to both of the waves. So if you've got an x-axis and a y-axis and a z-axis, maybe the electric field is on the x-axis, the magnetic field is on the y-axis, it's going to move along the z-axis. Or if the electric, electric is on x and magnetic is on z, it's going to move along the y-axis. Everything with magnetism seems to be perpendicular, right? Go back to the last unit that we were talking about Magnetic forces, everything seems to be perpendicular. This is no different. I want to show you a little animation right now of what's happening here. This is better than the diagram that I drew. Um, a, because it's, it's just drawn better, but B, because it's, it's moving as well. It's, it's dynamic as opposed to static here. We have our three axes, our x, y, and z axis. And we've got our magnetic field drawn in blue here, and we've got our electric field drawn in red here. You can see that... As we have a, a, a changing e a magnetic field along the z-axis generated, we also have a changing electric field along the y-axis generated. Now, you can also see that uh, as it's changing, okay, as one field is changing, it progresses to the right along the x-axis. And the reason that happens is because that changing magnetic field will generate the next changing electric field, and the changing electric field will generate the next changing magnetic field. Well, why do we keep having this, uh, this electric and magnetic field replaced here at the source? Well, we must still have the accelerating charged particle. Okay, that accelerating charged particle is still generating more and more and more electromagnetic radiation. That's what's happening all the time with the sun, right? That's what's happening with the radio station. Okay, we, we're not just generating a pulse of EMR, a pulse of electric and magnetic field. We're constantly generating more to replace what's moved out, what's been transmitted out. Does that make sense? Yeah, Jackie? The direction of propagation just means the direction that it moves. So this is moving to the right. We've got 
in this in this diagram right here, we've got our electric field. Okay, our, our electric field uh, changing in value in a sinusoidal nature, and so is our magnetic field in blue changing in a sinusoidal nature. But which way is it actually? Which way is it actually traveling here? Which way is the wave progressing? Okay, if we take a look at one wave, one wave pulse. Look at the look at the red trough right now. Which way is the red trough going at the bottom there? Which way is it going? It's going slowly to the to the right. Take a look at take a look at that blue crest there, that first blue crest. Which way is it moving? Slowly to the to the right. So this wave is moving to the right. Now, having said that, having said that, you ask a really good question. You say it looks like it's kind of moving to the left. In the end, if we have a source of electromagnetic radiation, which is an accelerating charged particle, you're going to get electromagnetic radiation generated in all directions. You're going to get EMR going this way and this way and this way and this way and this way. Each beam of it will have an electric and magnetic field that are perpendicular to each other, and it is traveling perpendicular to both of the, the fields. But it's going to go, I mean, they're drawing it here along the positive x-axis, but it's also going to go along the negative x-axis as well. Even though that's not the intent of the drawing, it would actually happen. Some of these terms are, you're going to be familiar with already. Some you're not. Electromagnetic radius exhibits the following properties of waves. Uh, we want to focus on this right now because a little bit later on, we're going to show you that EMR, which we think of as a wave, right? these electric field wave and magnetic field wave, sometimes exhibits properties of particles. In other words, sometimes it acts more like a rock being thrown than it does a wave being transmitted. But for the time being, we're going to talk about it in the context of a wave. There are at least four things, four properties of this, that these uh, beams of EMR exhibit that shows that it, that it acts like a wave. Polarization, diffraction, interference, and refraction. We'll talk about these three first, because these are the three that you learned about in Physics 20. Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave. Remember we had, you got these water waves. These water waves are coming towards this opening. What happens when these water waves go through the opening? They spread out, right? That's diffraction. Well, EMR, all types of EMR undergo diffraction. All types of EMR do this. This is a property of waves. Therefore, the idea of diffraction supports the wave nature of EMR. It supports the notion that EMR is a wave. Interference. We talked about interference as well last year. Constructive interference, destructive interference. When a crest meets a crest, we get constructive. When a trough meets a trough, we get constructive. When a crest meets a trough, we get destructive interference. EMR undergoes constructive and destructive interference. Well, interference is a property of waves. So there's evidence to suggest that EMR must be a wave. Refraction is the bending of a wave. Okay, when we've got a wave going in a particular direction, it strikes a new medium, changes speed, and when it changes speed, it changes direction. Okay, that's refraction. EMR undergoes refraction, and since refraction is a property of waves, there's more evidence to suggest that EMR is a wave. Polarization is the only one that we didn't talk about in Physics 20. Polarization is a filtering out of, of various components of a wave. Let's, uh, let's say I've got a board here. I've got a board with a very narrow slit cut into it. Now I've got a rope, and I'm creating a transverse wave in that rope. Okay? If I create a transverse wave that's vertical in that rope, with the crescent troughs vertical, will that wave go through that opening? Yes, it will. If I create a transverse wave that's horizontal with the crescent troughs that go horizontal, will that wave go through that opening? No. This board will filter out that horizontal component. What if I make my wave kind of at an angle of 45 degrees? So the crests are up at 45 this way, the troughs are down at 45 this way. Will it go through that opening? No. We would say that this is 
in a sense a polarizing filter it polarizes the wave it allows only one component of the wave to go through in this case the y component if i turn the board then i could cause the x component to go through if i turn it to 45 degrees then it could cause only the 45 degree component to go through does that make sense polarization is a property of waves if I throw a particle through there, I throw a rock through there, it doesn't matter which way I throw it, as long as it hits the hole, it's going to go through there, right? Polarization is a property of waves, not of particles. So if EMR undergoes polarization, there's even more evidence to suggest that EMR is a wave. Well, guess what? EMR does undergo polarization. I'm going to show you a little demonstration here now to show you that, in fact, EMR does undergo polarization. I'm going to do that by taking a couple polarizing filters, two polarizing filters. The first polarizing filter should act basically like this board. The second polarizing filter should act basically like this board. If I shine light through one of these polarizing filters, I should filter out all but one component of the light. If I shine it through a second filter, then it should filter out all but one component of the light. If I have these two polarizing filters or these two pieces of plywood oriented the same way, then there shouldn't be a dramatic difference if the wave is trying to go through both of them. If the vertical component of the wave will go through both of them. But what happens if I turn one of the pieces of plywood horizontal? What's going to happen now? the hole's going to get even smaller. In fact, you're going to be left with a point as opposed to a slit. So what's going to happen then? Well, in the first one, all but the vertical component of the EMR is filtered out. In the second one, if we change the orientation of that, all but the horizontal component of the EMR is filtered out. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen if we have both of these uh, one in front of another? There's no EMR going to get through, right? We're going to filter out all of the EMR. Okay, let's take a look at that now with real polarizing filters. See from the demonstration that the EMR, the light from the projector, does undergo polarization. That tells us that polarization, since polarization is a property of a wave, it tells us that EMR is a wave. More evidence to support the wave nature of the electromagnetic radiation. Okay, does that make sense? How was EMR first detected? How was it first verified, the theory of EMR first verified or first detected? Well, I was using an apparatus called a spark gap apparatus by a guy named Heinrich Kurtz. You guys recognize that name, right? We haven't used his name in the context of any kind of discoveries before, but you've definitely heard his name. Kurtz is the unit for what? Hertz is a unit for, it's, it's related to sound, yeah. Frequency, yeah, it's related to frequency. Okay, Hertz is the unit that we have for frequency. Um, it would make sense that that might be associated with electromagnetic radiation. If EMR is a wave, well, waves have a certain frequency. That's why the unit for frequency gets named after Hertz, the guy who first experimentally detected electromagnetic radiation. Here's what happens in this little spark gap apparatus that he has. He's got a potential difference across here. That generates, uh, that generates a current through this, uh, through this wire on the left-hand side here. Now, this transformer device, if you had taken physics 35 years ago, you, you'd, know, you'd understand a little bit more about transformers than we do right now. We would have learned about them last unit. Now we don't have to, so we don't. Okay, but the bottom line is, I'll tell you that a potential difference on this side can be increased dramatically on this side because we have more loops of wire on this side. So we're stepping up the voltage, basically, stepping up the potential difference. We're doing that because on the right-hand side, we've got a bit of a gap here in the wire, not a complete connection. If we have a small potential difference, then there's not going to be any current flowing on the secondary side. But if we have a really big potential difference, then we can actually get the electrons to jump that gap. So that's what we do. 
we take our small potential difference that we have on the left side, the blue side, and we step it up using a transformer to a high potential difference on the right-hand side. That high potential difference on the right-hand side will cause electrons that wouldn't normally go across this gap to jump across this gap. Let's think logically about this for a second. If these electrons are sitting there waiting to jump across this gap, and then they're jumping across the gap, then they have to accelerate in there somewhere. They have to speed up in there somewhere. According to Maxwell's theory, if these charged particles are speeding up across that gap, then they're going to generate EMR. They're going to generate electromagnetic radiation. So what Hertz does is sets up this antenna over here. This antenna consists only of a loop of wire. This loop of wire will have a current induced in it if, in fact, it detects EMR. So if EMR strikes it, a changing magnetic field strikes it, it's going to generate an electric current in this antenna. By measuring the amount of electric current, it can tell us whether or not there's, there's uh, a changing magnetic field and, therefore, electromagnetic radiation present. So he fires up the apparatus. Okay, a low potential difference on the blue side, a high potential difference induced on the, on the green side, causes the electrons to jump the gap, gap and accelerate, and sure enough, this antenna gets a current registering in it. That means that there must have been EMR present. When you flip the switch off, no current in the antenna. When you flip the switch on, current in the antenna, and so on. So that by that reasoning, we can say that this accelerating charged particle right here, the accelerating charged particle must have produced the changing magnetic field and changing electric field, which produced the current in the antenna. In other words, the accelerating charged particle generated the EMR. In other words, Maxwell's theory of EMR was correct. Now, the type of EMR that Maxwell would have used here, sorry, that uh, Hertz would have used here, was radio waves. Radio waves are the lowest frequency type of EMR. And the, the reason that they would have been used in this experiment is because they are the lowest frequency type of EMR. They're the easiest to generate. You can generate radio waves very easily with just an AC current. There's, a, there's, there's radio waves being generated right now in this room by the electricity going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in the wires and the walls. Very low intensity radio waves, but radio waves nonetheless just generated by an alternating current. So does that make sense? His point is to verify Maxwell's theory. He reasons that if he can detect a current in this antenna, then it must have been the accelerating charged particle that caused it. Sure enough, when the accelerating charged particle is there, he detects the current, therefore EMR must have been present, and it must have been caused by the accelerating charged particle. Therefore, Maxwell's theory is correct. called the type of EMR that he used, radio waves, the lowest frequency EMR that we have. So we called these radio waves the first type of EMR first experimentally verified or first experimentally detected. But there are several other kinds of EMR as well. Name another kind of EMR, please. Name another kind of electromagnetic radiation besides radio waves. You know this because we watched that video the other day, and the song is in your head right now. You can, you can give me the entire list, and you can probably give me the entire list in order right now as well, because that's the order that they were saying in that song. We've got gamma rays. Okay? So we've got, we've got radio waves. We've got gamma waves. What else we got? We've got microwaves. We've got ultraviolet. We get infrared. We've got X-rays. Somebody said. We get visible light. Can't forget that one. What else we got? Is that it? I think that's it. Actually, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's it. Now you can remember the order of these in terms of frequency by remembering that song. And that's great. If you remember that, then that's great. But there's another way to remember the order in terms of frequency of these as well. The way that I always used before before I ever found that song on YouTube. Let's start off with visible light. If visible light is made up of, you know this, right? You learned this in grade three or something. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, 
and violet. Roy G. Biv, right? Red has the lowest frequency of visible light, that is. Violet has the highest frequency of visible light. So visible light consists of all of these different colors. What type of EMR do you think would be lower frequency than visible light? The lowest type of frequency of visible light that we have is red light. What type of EMR would be below red? Infra red. What type of EMR would be above violet? Ultraviolet. We've got four more now to, to worry about. Radio waves, microwaves, x-rays, and gamma rays. Radio waves, to me, it stands to reason that they're going to come first since they were the first type of EMR that were experimentally detected. They're the easiest kind to detect, right? The easiest kind to produce and the easiest kind to detect. Therefore, they probably should come first. So let's put those down here. Microwaves come next. Okay, microwaves don't sound nearly as dangerous. They don't sound nearly as bad as X-rays and gamma rays. So they're going to come on the left-hand side of visible light. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet. We've got gamma rays and X-rays left now. Which one sounds worse? If you had to be exposed to one of them, which one would you rather be exposed to? X Probably x-rays, right? We're exposed to x-rays all the time, in fact. Okay, if, you, if you think that uh, you get, doctor thinks you have a broken bone, go get an x-ray, right? If gamma rays sound worse for us, then logically they're going to go on the right-hand side of the spectrum. Now, that's not to say that x-rays can't be just as bad for you as gamma rays. I'm not suggesting that because gamma rays are on the far right-hand side that they are necessarily always worse for you. But that's the way that we can remember that they're on the right-hand side. Okay, we can remember that they sound worse, so let's throw, them on, let's throw them to the far right. They sound a lot worse than visible light, so let's put them as far away from visible light to the right as we can. And x-rays, of course, are going to go in there. Now, I've got some bad news for you, but I've also got some good news to follow that up, okay? Here's the bad news. Each one of these types of EMR, all seven of these types of EMR, has a frequency range, a wavelength range, and an energy range. So there are, theoretically, 21 different ranges of numbers that we need to know here. We need to be able to identify, if we're given a particular frequency, what kind of EMR it is. We need to be able to identify, if we're given a particular energy, what kind of EMR it is. Two bits of good news now. The bad news is there's 21 things to remember, 21 different ranges of numbers to remember here. And that sounds bad. The good news is we don't have to worry about energy yet. We'll worry about energy later on, okay? So there's only 14 things right now. Frequency and wavelength. Here's the really good news here. I used to teach that, like, you know, remember these different frequencies and so on. And, and I think, to be honest, I think a lot of people probably still do teach it that way. Okay, but I believe if we can take a little bit of a shortcut and still, still get things the way we're supposed to get them, then let's do that. Okay, here's my little shortcut. Okay, I remember, I just physically memorized that visible light is 4 times 10 to the 14 hertz to 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. I physically memorize that microwaves are 10 to the 9 hertz to 10 to the 12 hertz. We don't have to be as specific with the other types as we do with visible light. So orders of magnitudes are OK with the other types. I physically memorize that x-rays are 10 to the 17 hertz to 10 to the 20 hertz. And of the 21 things that I've got to know, seven different frequency ranges, seven different wavelength ranges, and seven different energy ranges, that's all I memorize. 
if you're given a frequency that is 6.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz, what is it? Visible light. If you're given a frequency that's uh, 6.5 times 10 to the 11 hertz, what is it? It's microwaves. If you're given a frequency that's 6.5 times 10 to the 13 hertz, what is it? It's, it's, it's infrared. If it's 6.5 times 10 to the 13, well, it's not microwaves, and it's not visible light, so it's got to be it's got to be in between. Don't memorize all seven of them. Memorize those three. And then if it's something in between, then it's got to be the one that's in between there. Does that make sense? Now, what do we do with the wavelengths? Do we have to remember four, three different wavelengths as well? Well, that would be still good news, because it beats remembering seven different wavelengths. But there's even better news. There's even better news here. We don't have to remember any wavelengths. Because if you know the universal wave equation, v is equal to f times lambda, and you rearrange that equation, f is equal to v over lambda, and you're given a particular wavelength, and you want to identify what it is, get the frequency. And then compare it along those three frequency ranges that you just memorized. Does that make sense? So for instance, you're given a wavelength of 6.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. What is it? Well, let's use this equation, v over lambda. What's the speed, by the way? What's the speed of all of these types of EMR? 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So let's say, let's make this 6 times 10 to the negative 7, just to make it easier math here. Okay, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Let's divide that by the wavelength here. We get 6 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. We do the math there, it works out to be 5.0 times 10 to the 14 hertz. What kind of EMR is it? 5 times 10 to the 14 is going to be? It's going to be visible light. Does that make sense? We got seven frequencies, you got to remember three of them. We got seven wavelength ranges, you got to remember none of them. Get the frequency of that particular wavelength. You got seven different energies. Well, you're going to do something similar with energy as you did with, with wavelength here. We're just not going to do it yet until we get to our last unit. Okay. Bottom line is it's no harder than, than calculating the frequency from the wavelength. Finally, this is our last little thing here. It's good timing because class is almost over here. How are each of these produced? Well, they're all produced by accelerating charged particles, right? Charged particles speeding up, slowing down. Specifically, how are they produced? Okay, radio waves and microwaves are specifically produced by oscillating electric charge. Three else. It's only two else, isn't it? Oscillating electric charge. What does that really mean? Electric charge that's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Infrared, visible light, and ultraviolet. You guys find as you start saying these in order, that song starts going into your head? Infrared, visible light, and ultraviolet are all produced by transitions of electrons in atoms. What do we mean by that? Well, electrons are on higher levels. As they fall down to a lower level, they give off EMR. It's going to be one of these three types of EMR that's given off, depending upon the transition. If you've got a really, really big transition, maybe it's a really high energy EMR, like ultraviolet, that's produced. If you have a small transition, it's going to be a low energy, like infrared, that's produced. Now, x-rays can also be produced by these transitions of electrons and atoms, but they're not normally. Okay, x-rays are normally produced by rapidly decelerating electrons. What does that mean? When an electron is accelerated to a really, really high speed by a potential difference, EI equals EF, and then it's made to smash into a target. It's made to smash into a piece of metal. When it hits that piece of metal, it stops almost instantly. So kinetic energy has to go somewhere. 
the kinetic energy of that electron that just stopped almost instantly gets converted to a photon, gets converted to light, an X-ray photon. Okay, you go to the dentist, you get X-rays. My son was just there yesterday. He gets X-rays. Okay, what they're doing is uh, in this X-ray tube, they're not firing X-rays at your teeth. They're firing X-rays in this X-ray tube at a piece of metal. Then these X-rays are generated. These electrons are fired at this metal. Okay, it generates these, these X-rays. These X-rays are focused through your teeth. Okay, and then they generate an image, a picture of your teeth, just like a, a photograph does. Okay, just like a regular photograph does, except that X-rays have a higher penetrating power so they can actually go through gaps in your teeth or cavities in your teeth or broken bones or whatever. Finally, gamma rays are produced by nuclear decay. Nuclear decay, where we have matter, mass, converted to energy. When we went over the last test, we just talked about this, right? That one question, number 14, involved... Some of you thought it was conservation of mass. Well, I said it wasn't conservation of mass because matter was converted to energy. At that point, it wasn't really a fair question because you didn't know that. Okay. Now we know that matter can be converted to energy. It won't be until unit four that you learn when exactly that happens. But. Make sense? Okay, let's wrap it up there. Except for, oh, I almost forgot this. Oh, phew. There was some good news there. There's even more good news. No, um, we finished just in time. To give you some check and reflect questions on page 647, number 1 to 2, 5 to 9, and 11 to 14. 1 to 2, 5 to 9, and 11 to 14 for tomorrow, please. Okay, have a good night, everyone.